So my name is Dr. Christina Stanley, or Chrissy, if you want to call me Chrissy, that's fine. And I'm from the University of Chester, and I'm going to be talking to you today about animal social networks. So this is what my research mostly focuses on. Um, so I'm going to tell you a bit about the research I've done in the past, the things I'm doing at the moment, and a bit about animal social networks in general. So first of all, I thought I'd give you a quick introduction about who I am. So first of all, I'm a behavioural ecologist. So that means I'm a biologist and I do a lot of work on animal behaviour, but mostly on wild animal behaviour or about how animals are adapted to certain conditions. So all about how their behaviour has evolved over time. I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Cambridge. I was always very interested in animals, in particular in horses when I was growing up. And so I went to Cambridge to study zoology. So I did natural sciences and I specialised in zoology in my final year. I then went to Manchester Metropolitan University where I did my MSc in behavioural and evolutionary ecology. So I became a bit more specialised and that's allowed me to spend some time in Kenya, which really brought my passion for working in Africa to the forefront of my working career. And I then did my PhD at the University of Manchester. And in my PhD, I worked on the Carnevi mountain ponies. You can see a photo of them in the top left of the screen. So the Carnevi mountain ponies live in the Carnevi mountains, as you might guess, which are part of the Snowdonia mountain range, so not too far from us. And there are about 250 of these semi-feral ponies. So they're owned by farmers, but otherwise they're free to range the hills for most of the year. I was actually involved in their annual roundup on Sunday. So we just bring them in once a year to do some health checks on them, but otherwise they're a wild population of horses. So in my PhD work, I did some work on their social behaviour, which I'll talk about later on, and a bit of work on the genetics as well. And then since 2015, I've been working at the University of Chester. So I'm a senior lecturer in animal behaviour and welfare. And you can see a photo on the left, which shows the kind of things I do. These are two of my master's students who I supervise to go and do a census of primates in Ghana. So I do a lot of work with an NGO in Ghana, which um, works on conserving their critically endangered species of primates in that country. So two of my, well, a few of my students have got to go out there and carry out a few months of survey work in the rainforest. So during my university um, time at the University of Chester, I've supervised a lot of students. I supervise students doing undergraduate projects, doing master's projects, and I also have a couple of PhD students at the moment. And then I teach across all the different levels of students at the university. So I find that really good. And at the moment, it means it's mostly online. So I'm pretty used to doing this. So what am I going to talk about today? I thought I'd give you a quick overview so that you know what I'm going to cover. So first of all, what are social networks? There's a lovely diagram on the right here of what a social network might look like, but what is it? I'm going to give you some examples from my previous research. I'm going to talk about how we actually collect the data for the animal social networks to start with. So how do we get the numbers for it? I'm going to talk about some of the applications of the research. So what do we use it for? What's it useful for? Then I'm going to talk about Livingston's fruit bats in a bit more depth. That's the study species I'm working on most at the moment. I'm going to give you a quick um, overview of some of the other current research I'm doing and then invite any questions from you that you might have on this work. So I think this talk is going to be about half an hour, something like that. I don't like to do talks that are too long online because I find them very tiring and I think the audience do as well. So I'll try to keep it short, but then leave lots of time for you to ask questions about what you're most interested in afterwards. So let's talk, talk, start by talking about what social networks actually are. So to do this, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to show you a human network. So when you think of social networks, you probably think of Facebook. Facebook is what most people would consider to be a social network in humans. So Facebook is a way that people meet each other or make friends with each other online and everyone is connected to certain other people via Facebook. You have Facebook friends. And because I'm really sad and because I do work on social networks, I downloaded my Facebook information about, I think this is about five or six years ago now, but I downloaded the actual data and built my own network based on my Facebook friends. So all these dots on the screen, these are all people that I'm friends with on Facebook or I was friends with six years ago. It's probably changed since then a little bit. And what I did was I put all these into my computer program 
and I asked it to tell me what was the structure of these friendships. So of my friends, who was friends with my other friends? If they were friends with each other, they would have a link between them. I then used a complicated um, statistical analysis to tell me what is the best sort of group structure of the network. So in other words, how would the computer program, not knowing these people, not knowing anything about them, how would this computer program best cluster them together into smaller groups? And those smaller groups um, are shown by different colours on the screen. And I then went in and labelled them. So you can see, for example, my biggest group of friends is my horsey folk I've put here. So they're the ones in pink. And that's because I ride horses. I keep horses at a livery yard, or I used to. And so I got to know a lot of people with horses and they all know each other. So they're all closely linked together. You can see I have lots of friends from my undergrad university degree at Cambridge. So they're all these black nodes that are all friends with each other. I have some from my Manchester degree, some of them are academics. Some of them um, are people that I know from Wales. I just call them my Welsh friends. But you can see here there are some people that aren't linked to anyone else at all. So, for example, somewhere I used to work, these people in the middle or my old work friends, they aren't linked with anyone else. So they're just linked with each other. And then you can see there are these red dots at the top. These are people that I'm friends with who don't know any of my other friends at all. So this is a really weird kind of network because I'm actually linked to all these individuals, but you can't see me on it. But normally you would have a network that shows all the animals in a social group or in a population and how they're linked together. So obviously, if we're looking at animals, we're not going to look at Facebook friends. We're going to look at the equivalent in the animal kingdom. So that could be who they spend time with. So who they spend time in close proximity with. Um, it could be who they mutually groom or who they're affiliative with, who they have friendly relationships with. It could also be who they're aggressive with. So these links could be who is aggressive towards who. Or we could use more complicated things. We could look at genetics. So we could see who are more closely related to which other individuals in the network. The useful thing about these kind of networks, if you imagine these are animals, we can then model or predict how things will change in the future. So, for example, say one of these individuals um, gets infected with a disease, let's say with COVID, because that's what we talk about all the time at the moment. So if one of these people, if we imagine that COVID was transmitted through Facebook, which obviously it isn't, but I'm sure some people might think it is. Imagine if my old work friends, if they were transmitted, if they were infected with COVID, that would only pass between them in this network. It wouldn't pass to any of my other friends because they're not linked. But if, for example, one of the individuals that links one of these networks, maybe one of the, my horsey friends is also friends with my Chester friends and some of my people from school and my family. If one of those um, contracted COVID, they would very quickly pass it to all the people in their network and in surrounding networks because they would be linked to them. So it's very interesting to look at disease spread to predict how diseases will spread in the future and also how we can target diseases, so how we can vaccinate individuals. We can also look at information transfer. So this is why social networks were originally used. They're mostly used to look at how information flows. So if you imagine these are all people who work in a big company, for example, we might want to think about how um, a gossip, some kind of gossip might spread throughout the company or some kind of new innovation. So obviously, if one of these red dots um, was given some really interesting gossip or taught a new technique, they wouldn't really pass it on to anyone else. But if you wanted to get that through the whole company quite quickly, you might pass it on to one of these individuals that links lots of these different groups. So we can look at the spread of information in social networks as well, in animals just the same as in humans. So that just gives you a quick overview of what social networks are. So now I'm going to talk about some examples from my previous research to give you a bit more perspective about this. So one of the first projects I worked on was the goats on the Great Orm in Clandidno. So I'm sure a lot of you have been to Clandidno and seen these goats. They were actually a present to Queen Victoria, I believe, from an Arab sheikh. Um, but they now live on the Great Orm. And there are a number of males and females in this group. And I was just looking at the female data. So this network on the right shows all the females that were in the social group at the time. And this is actually an aggression network. So I don't know if you can see, but there are little arrows on this and the arrows show who they're aggressive to. So this individual here in the middle, that's called Kay, received lots of aggression. She has lots of arrows coming into her. 
Um, I can't see any that are particularly aggressive to others. Um, but if you found maybe Stella, Stella doesn't have any arrows coming into her, but she has quite a lot going out from her. So she's quite aggressive to other individuals. The thicker the line, the more frequent the aggression is. So Molly and Izzy are very aggressive towards each other. And we also had data from two other populations of goats in Scotland on the Isle of Rum. And we actually found that these networks had a very similar structure in these different populations. So we showed that wherever the goats found themselves, whatever habitat they were in, they had the same kind of structure of relationships. And with these goats, we also found that their aggression network, so this one here that we can see, was a very similar shape to the network we'd get for friendly interactions, for affiliation. And that means basically, if you're a goat, you are aggressive or friendly to whoever happens to be close to you. So if you spend lots of time with a particular other goat, you're going to be nice to them some of the time, or you're going to be aggressive to them when you're not as happy. So goats don't have very specialised relationships. They seem to just be aggressive or friendly to whoever they spend time with. But if we look at horses, it's a bit different. So with horses, I found that their aggression network was a very different shape to their friendly behaviour, their affiliative network. So horses refrain from being aggressive to their close friends. So we actually showed that they, the females had very close friendships that would, well, quite close friendships that would persist over a number of years. So female horses will have very strong friendships that are very important to them for some reason that will last for a long time. And interestingly, in the horses, they aren't aggressive to their close friends. So it shows they have these different types of relationships. So they're going to be more aggressive to individuals that they have um, less clear friendships with within the social group. And this network here on the left looks very different to the other one I showed you. It's more sparse. It doesn't have as many links. And that's because this is a mutual grooming network. So these ponies don't groom each other very frequently. They spend a lot of time eating and doing other things. But when they did groom each other, I would record that as an observation. And this network was built over about a year of observations. So during that time, these are the individuals I saw grooming each other. And what's interesting in this, um, I don't know if you can see because they're a bit small, but the females are the circles on this network and the males are the diamonds. And you can see that the males tend to groom more individuals than do the females. And that's usually because there's one male who's in charge of a group of females, in charge of a harem of females, and he has to maintain close relationships with all his females to keep them in his group. And so he will groom them quite frequently and they will groom him quite frequently to stay in his good books. So the males carry out lots of grooming. But obviously there are more, there are other males within these groups that you can see, and they're all immature males. And these immature males are probably learning the social skills they'll need in the future. So they're carrying out lots of grooming to maintain these sorts of associations with other individuals, but to learn how to be a good stallion, to learn how to one day build up their own harem of females. Now I'm going to move on to cockroaches. So I'm sure lots of people don't like cockroaches. They get a bit of a bad press. But during my PhD, I actually did some work on these little cockroaches called Pacific beetle roach. They don't look too much like a cockroach. They're, they're quite chill, they're quite friendly. But what I did was I looked at their friendly interactions and their aggressive interactions, but mostly just about who they spent time with. And if you look at this network on the right, the females are the circles and the males are the diamonds. Unfortunately, I've cut off part of this network when I made this slide, but you can imagine, I think the other individual is a male that isn't shown on there. But I've made the nodes bigger, so the nodes are the individuals in the network, so these are individual cockroaches. And I've made them bigger if they um, are more, um, more gregarious, so spend more time with others. So you can see that the females are bigger on this they have bigger circles and the males have diamonds and that's because the females are more gregarious in this species they spend more time closely together and so this network shows that it's the females that kind of maintain sociality with each other they kind of group together and the males are more on the periphery they're more on the outside and now on to Livingston's fruit bats so this is work I'm doing at the moment with Jersey Zoo I'll tell you a bit more about these fruit bats later on, but
but the, work, the population I work on is a captive population at Jersey Zoo. We did used to have a few of these fruit bats at Chester Zoo. You may have seen them. I think they moved from there about five or six years ago, but they used to be with the Rodriguez and Seba's fruit bats in the bat cave. But we don't have any of these at Chester anymore. So this network here is looking at the female fruit bats and looking at their affiliation network. So affiliation just means friendly interactions. It means kind of positive interactions, so no aggression. And this is just looking at different ages of females to see how females decide who to spend time with, what's important when they choose their friendships. And what we found in this project was that the females tended to have closer friendships with the individuals who are similar in age, which you'd probably expect. So individuals may form these friendships quite young when they're pups, or they may form them when they're older, but they tend to spend more time with individuals who are of a similar age to them. We also found that the females that had young babies um, that were lactating, that were breastfeeding the babies at the moment, um, also had fewer friendly interactions. So they seem to be pushed to the outside of the social group. They receive more aggression and they receive few of these friendly interactions. So it's quite an important management thing to think about the welfare of these females with these young pups, whether they're receiving higher levels of aggression or they're on the outside of the group. So now Jersey Zoo isolate these females with pups and they keep them separate while the pups are very young so that they don't receive lots of aggression from the other individuals. So I've given you a quick overview of what I've done um, recently, but let's talk about how we build those networks. So these are just lines on paper on the computer, aren't they? So how does that happen? How do we watch animals and come up with numbers to make these things? Well, here are some of the examples from the work I've done. So the most important thing for making animal social networks is you need to be able to identify the individuals. So you can't do social network analysis unless you know who is who, because you need to know who is carrying out the interaction with which other individual at all times. So with the cockroaches, that was pretty easy for me because I could use nail varnish. So you can see this picture on the left. This is a cockroach cage that I constructed, a small kind of 2D landscape that they could live in for a few weeks. And you can see that I put nail varnish on the backs of the cockroaches. So this is non-toxic, it didn't cause any um, problem with them, it didn't seem to irritate them or change their behaviour in any way, but it allowed me to identify them. So I had a CCTV camera above them at all times, and then I could pause that film and I could record who was spending time with who. So where they were, who was, close, who was nearest neighbour of which other individual. But obviously with wild animals we don't really want to be marking them unless we have to. A lot of animals we really can't be marking them to make them distinguishable from each other. So with the ponies it was very easy because they all have very different markings. So you can see here this pony here has this very clear facial marking that has a kind of bit nicked out of it by the eye and you can also see that um, she's got some white on her legs as well. So we can use the different shapes of white on these ponies to identify them. It was a lot more difficult with the greys, so white ponies are very hard to identify from each other, especially when they're soaking wet in the middle of storm. So it was easier to identify some individuals than others. But you can take account of that when you're doing your maths at the end of the um, observation period. But with other animals, there are other ways you can tell them apart. So for example, with my Livingston's fruit bats, luckily they have a really nice patch on the back of their neck. You can see here, this one has a kind of bat shaped patch on the back of her neck. And they all have different shape patches and different colors as well. So you can use these to identify individuals. They also sometimes have little bits missing from their ears from fights they've had in the past with other fruit bats. So those are quite easy to identify. But what people often do is to put tags on animals. So for example, birds, you might put rings on their legs, different colored rings to identify them from each other. Other animals, you might shave bits of their fur um, in different places to give them distinguishable marks. But most of the time, we try and use animals with natural markings so that we don't have to interfere with them. And I've just shown you this picture in the middle. This is the Livingston fruit bats um, enclosure at, at Jersey Zoo. It's a great big enclosure. You can see the fruit bats are here in the background. They're quite small. It's quite a big enclosure for them. Um, so the bats themselves are very big. They have one of the biggest wingspans of a fruit bat but you can see that the enclosure is big enough to allow them to move around quite easily. 
And the good thing about this enclosure is that we're allowed to go into the enclosure as researchers and just stand there and watch the fruit bats carrying on their daily lives. So it's very easy to be able to record their behaviour. And I'm just going to show you a quick example of another way we might record their behaviour. So hopefully this will load and you'll be able to see it. You won't be able to hear it, but that's fine. You don't need to. This is a video that I took of the Livingston's fruit bats. And you can see the Livingston's ones are the bigger ones. They're also in with Rodriguez fruit bats, which are the smaller ones. So to give you some perspective, the Rodriguez ones are the ones in the bat cave at Chester Zoo that you may have seen. So Livingston's fruit bats are quite a bit bigger than them. But you can see straight away there are lots of interactions going on during this feeding time. So you can see that if we define behaviours, so if we, if we can write down a description of a behaviour, we can then record when that behaviour is being carried out. So there was some aggression there, for example. There's a Rodriguez fruit bat approaching another one and that fruit bat is ignoring it, it's not moving away. You can see some clear aggression in another part of the enclosure. You won't see many friendly interactions when they're feeding, they tend to have a few more fights going on. But you can see if we have definitions for the behaviours, we can quite easily record when one individual is being aggressive to another individual. Let me go back to my screen. So that's how we record the behaviour and how we'd identify individuals. But obviously that takes a lot of time. You need somebody to be there observing the animals at all times. So nowadays there are better ways of doing it sometimes, and that's using technology. So if you have a look at this figure at the top, which I've taken from a published paper by Krauss et al, you can see that this is an example of how we use technology to track animals. So at the top, you can see a new Caledonian crow. And if you can look on its back, it's got a little kind of backpack that's probably glued to its feathers. And it has a little bit sticking out here. This is a transmitter. So this bird will have some kind of GPS tag with a microchip. And that means that we're able to track that bird. We're able to find out where it is at any point in time. And you can use all this information in a computer program to build up a network to show whether they are associating with another crow, whether they're in the same space as another crow at the same time. And you can see how small, this is one of the microchips that might be used, one of the little tags. You can see this is a, a finger, so it's a very tiny little tag. Usually the limitation for these things is you need batteries and the batteries weigh a lot more than the technology you're using. So for things like a crow, they can carry a little bit of weight, but not too much weight. We don't want to impact on their flight. So that's something that people have to consider when they're choosing what to use to track these animals. And here's a network on the right that was built up from these crows movements. Another way you can do it is what they do in the University of Oxford. They have a place called Wytham Woods, where they've been researching great tits and lots of other bird species for at least um, 20 years, I think. But these tits are all tagged. They all have little ring, little tags on their legs, like this ring here. And all they've done is attached a little microchip to that ring. So if any of you have a cat or a dog, they probably have a microchip in their neck for, so that we can identify them. So they do exactly the same with these great tits. They put a little microchip on their um, ring on their leg. And that means that whenever they go to a microchip reader, we can locate them. So this is one of their feeding stations. You can't see it very clearly in the photo, but it's just like a normal feeder. But it has a microchip reader. So every time one of these great tits visits the feeders, it reads their microchip. So the researchers know which tits are feeding at which feeders. And more importantly, which ones come together in a group so we can find out about their social groups and who they're spending time with. And you can get some really complicated networks and find out, for example, whether different species are spending more time with each other, whether different individuals are spending time with each other. And they can also do things like experiments where they remove individuals from the group and then bring them back in to see how it affects their social dynamics. So this is something that we're trialling with these fruit bats at the moment. So fortunately, it's quite good timing with COVID. My PhD student, Morgan, has been re doing research on these bats. She's been going to Jersey for three month periods and spending time watching their behaviour. But now because of COVID, she's not able to go there. And so luckily, we've been trialling these readers, which we're now using to collect behavioural data without the need for her to be there. 
And this is an example of the early prototype of this reader here on the right. And it follows the same principle I've just mentioned. So all these fruit bats have a microchip in their neck. You may not know this, but most zoo animals do have a microchip inserted so that the zoos are able to identify them from each other. So all of these bats were chipped already as pups. And this big circle here is just a microchip reader. If any of you have a cat flap that automatically recognises your cat, it's exactly the same principle. So the bat will pass through this loop and it will register their ID from their microchip. And we put the food in the bottom so they have to access the food. It has um, a, pers a kind of plastic bit around here so that they can't come in a different way. They have to come in through the reader. And there's a little computer here that actually measures their weight as well. So we have a strain gauge on this so that when they climb onto this bit of netting to access the food, it'll actually measure their weight as well. So this is going to be really useful for the zoo because normally they have to catch them once a year to weigh them. But this will mean they'll be able to weigh them remotely without having to interfere with them. So I'm just going to show you a quick video of this in action. This again is one of our early prototypes that we were testing. So you can see the person is using some food to get the bats come through. Oh, sorry, it's being a bit slow. Let's see if it works. Um, I'm just going to try pausing it, playing it there, that's better. So the bat quite comfortably comes through the loop and gets some food. And you can see the numbers on the left are changing. This is recording the bat's weight. So we would take the average of all these measures to find out what their actual weight is. They're coming out a bit, have a little chew, and then going back in. And obviously bats always would feed like this, they'd feed upside down. So we're using their natural behavior to design a device that works best for them. So you'd have a very different device for other different types of animals. But for the fruit bats, this seems to work really well. This is a very rough version. Obviously, you can see all these um, tags in place. So the finished version looks a lot better than this. But this was just when we were first trialing it. So they seem to be working quite well and allowing us to gather data on who's feeding where and with which other individuals. OK, so what's the point of this research? So Nowadays, as scientists, we don't do research for the sake of this. We don't get money for doing research for research's sake. We do research that has a practical application that's going to be useful to society in some way. So what is the point of social networks? What can we use those for in the real world? Well, a really big sphere in which we use social networks and animals is in conservation. So I'll give you an example here with these bats. These are called Bechstein's bats. And you can see here at the top, there are two different diagrams showing their social networks. So in 2009, they had two very distinct social networks. They had the red group and the blue group, and they never mixed together. They were always very separate. In 2012, they got exactly the same, they used the same methods, and they built the network again, and it was very different. So the blue, first of all, there were much fewer bats but also they were much more integrated with each other. They were all one big social group. And that's because between 2009 and 2012, there was a really heavy deforestation in the area. So the area where they roosted was broken up into lots of little fragments by deforestation. There was very little habitat left. And that resulted in lots of the deaths of lots of these bats. But it also meant that because there were fewer bats left, they formed a much different structured social network. So this can be really important for us both to predict the effects of human interventions. So, for example, what the effects of deforestation might be or the effects of building a road, for example, might be on an, um, the animal social group. But we can also use these networks to find out what the effects have been of something we're not aware of at the time. So, for example, if there's a disease in um, the population, we can see how it's affected the social structure. Or we can see how maybe the introduction of one species has affected another species social structure. So it's very important for animals, especially that are endangered, to understand how their populations are changing according to the effects that we're having on them. And I've got a picture of a dolphin here as well. So some other work has been carried out on this species of dolphin. They used to have a lot of trawlers in the area where the dolphins lived. So the trawler boats would go out to trawl for prawns. And one of the group of dolphins formed around these trawler ships and they would follow the trawlers every day 
and they would get the bycatch from them. So they would see them as a source of food. And that meant that the dolphin population was split into two very distinct populations. So one population that followed the trawlers around and one population that didn't. So they seemed to just keep well away from the boats. Uh, maybe they feared them, maybe they had different personalities, but you had two very different groups of dolphins. Then it was declared to be an area where there was no fishing allowed. So it was a conservation area. And that meant all the trawlers were excluded from the area. Within a few months of that happening, the social structure in the dolphins totally changed. These two distinct populations started to mix together a lot more, and now they're one big population. And that can be really important to understand because if we have animals split into lots of different groups, that can have implications for disease, for example. It can have implications for inbreeding. So we want animals to be able to breed with as many individuals as we can so that they don't become inbred. So social networks can be really useful to find out what these things are affecting. And sometimes the things that we do as humans aren't affecting them in the way that we think they are. Another really nice example, this is from 2013 to give you some context. So this is looking at European badgers. I think this was carried out in Oxford. So this network here shows different social groups of badgers in the UK. And you can see they're in quite distinct social groups. You normally have a kind of family group of badgers that are very close together, that spend lots of time together. And what's really interesting here is they then TB tested all these badgers. So they tested them for bovine TB. And the ones that were red were the ones that came up as TB positive. What's really interesting is the ones that were more likely to be positive are also the ones that are more likely to link different social groups. These tended to be males that moved between social groups. But it's very interesting to find out that the ones that were more likely to move between groups were the more likely to carry TB. So it could be that they're more likely to contract TB because they contract it somewhere between groups. It could be that they're pushed out of groups because they have TB, maybe. But for whatever reason, the ones that have TB tend to be on the periphery of the network and they tend to be linking these social groups. And this has big implications for the badger culls that have been carried out. So culls are much more likely to target the social groups of badgers because they're easy to find. So if people are going out with guns, they're going to find a set and they're going to kill the badgers around that set. But that means they're not culling the ones that have TB. The ones that have TB are still roaming around and they're much more likely to roam over a much bigger area if you're culling these social groups. So actually this was evidence against carrying out any kind of badger culling because it wasn't going to be effective. If anything, it was going to make the situation worse. And that was in 2013. So imagine if the government had listened to the scientists at that time, probably could have saved a lot of money. And what about managing captive animals? Well, there was some seminal work on social networks on this primate in the top left. These are pigtailed macaques. And this work found out that they had different social roles. So just like in our society, we have different jobs, we form different functions. We have exactly the same in some species of animal, particularly in primates. So in these pigtail macaques, they had these individuals that acted as what they call policers. So they would police any fights that broke out. If a fight broke out, they would intervene and they would maintain the peace. When they removed these policers from the captive groups, everything fell apart, it became pandemonium. There was lots of aggression. The whole network changed its shape and all the little social groups fell apart. And then when the policers were brought back in, suddenly peace was restored and everything went back to normal. So it's very important to understand these social roles that individuals play by using network analysis when we're managing captive populations. Because when we, when we have animals in captivity, we're removing the ability that they have to move between social groups. We're restricting them. So we need to manage aggression. We need to make sure that their welfare is of a good level so that they're not subject to aggression. In the wild, animals would often leave a social group if they were being victimised by other animals. In captivity, they often can't do that. So it's very important that we understand the social roles they have and we understand what they need in that social group to maintain stability. And that's something we're doing in these fruit bats. Here's another example. These were chimpanzees at Edinburgh Zoo. 
So they used to have two distinct social groups of these chimpanzees. And then they decided to make a really nice, big natural enclosure for them all to live in. So they put both the groups together into the same enclosure. I assume they probably put them a bit separate to start with, so they didn't fight too much. But when they first put these chimps into the enclosure, you can see the top network was produced. So you can see there are two very distinct social groups with just one individual linking the groups, which is interesting. But then within a few months, this is what the network looked like. It was much more um, or more cohesive. The individuals were mixing much more freely. And there was and what was interesting is between these two time periods, the rates of aggression decreased dramatically. So the more um, cohesive the group was, the less aggression. So we can use social network analysis to see how our management is working to see whether what we're doing is having a beneficial effect on the animals we're managing. I have a colleague who's also working on greater flamingos. So we don't know a lot about social behaviour in flamingos, but he's using social network analysis because they all have different coloured rings on them, on their legs. You can identify them. So he's looking at how they form social groups, what kind of friendships they have, what kind of relationships, but also whether this correlates with things like foot um, health issues. So whether we can use social behaviour to identify individuals that might be in pain so we can go in and treat them. And I've got a picture of a dairy cow as well, because it's not just exotic animals in the zoos that this is useful for. We're now using network analysis on the farm animals as well to find out the best way to manage them for their individual welfare. So network analysis is really useful for looking at individuals about how they experience the world. So it's very useful to make sure that all their welfare is the best it can be. OK, so I'm just going to talk about Livingston's fruit bats in a bit more depth because that's my main project at the moment and they're quite interesting animals, I think. So Livingston's fruit bats, you'll see at the bottom, they're critically endangered. They're the highest level of being endangered that it's possible to have. So they're really at risk. And that's because they have a very small population that's very highly at risk from natural occurrences. So this picture here shows Madagascar. On the left, you can see this is Africa and Madagascar is just to the right. Madagascar is this big in this bigger picture is the main island and just up to the northwest of it, you can see two little tiny red islands. These are called Anjuan and Meheli, and they are part of the Comoros Islands. And the Livingston fruit bats only live on these two little islands, the Comoros Islands. They're not just on these two islands, they're restricted to little tiny roost sites on each of these islands. So the islands have been farmed a lot over the years. A lot of the land has been taken away from the wildlife and turned into farmland. And so the fruit bats have been driven to the highest cliffs where it's impossible to farm. So they have these small roosts on the top of these cliffs, on the top of mountains, on these little tiny islands. These islands are really susceptible to tropical cyclones. So at any time, these po this population of wild animals could be wild, could be totally wiped out. We think there are just over a thousand of these animals left in the wild on these two populations. So it's totally possible that something could happen, a cyclone, a tsunami, and this whole population of this species could be wiped out. And Gerald Durrell um, foresaw this. He thought that this would be a very high likelihood. And so in the 1990s, he brought some Livingston's fruit bats into captivity to start a captive breeding population. He brought them to Jersey Zoo, which is the zoo he set up. Nowadays, we have 80 Livingston's fruit bats in captivity. This is in the whole world. So there are only 80 in captivity in the whole world. And they're split within two captive populations. One of the populations is at Jersey Zoo, where there are currently around 67 individuals. The other population, with about 13 individuals, is at Bristol Zoo. So that's it for this species. They're the only captive population. So they're very important breeding populations because in the future, they might be very important for reintroductions if the wild population was decimated. And I showed you before, this is their beautiful enclosure that they live in at Jersey Zoo. Um, I'm not very good at physics, but it's designed to give them the best thermals so that they're able to fly quite easily. And they can fly in a big circle. There's a kind of island in the middle and they can fly all the way around it. And you can see it's a really naturalistic enclosure as well. There are lots of wild, lots of plants um, that they can eat the wild berries from in the summer. 
and it's kept at the right kind of temperature for them. But it's also carbon neutral, so it's designed in a way that uses lots of waste material. I think the walls are made from old tyres filled with cement um, and it's heated by using, I think it's biogas. So it's a carbon neutral enclosure. So it's a really nice example of an animal enclosure. In the middle, you can see my PhD student, Morgan, who is currently working with this population. So Morgan's been working with them for about two years. She spent about six months in this enclosure with them. She did leave the enclosure at night. She wasn't there all the time, but she spent a lot of time in with them. And she was recording their social behavior. Um, also, at the same time, she was collecting fecal samples from them. So she's got all the fecal samples back at Chester. And that's because we want to look at their stress hormones. So we know that different animals have different levels of stress hormones. And we want to find out whether that is linked with their role in the social group. So for example, if an animal is suffering from more aggression from other individuals, is it going to be more stressed? Probably. If it has lots more friendly interactions, we think they're probably going to be less stressed. But animals have the ability to sort of regulate their responses to stress as well. So it's a bit more complicated than that. So she'll be extracting what we call cortisol, or corticosterone, from the bat's faeces so that she can carry out analysis of their hormones and link that to their social roles in the social group. She's also carried out a lot of work to look at their social relationships. We've published a paper a few months ago looking at which animals had stronger social relationships with each other than others and what was important in determining who they were friends with and how long the friendships persisted. And as I said before, she's also using these microchip readers to measure their feeding interactions, so to record which individuals are feeding at the same time. So that's a really exciting project. Um, it's a shame that COVID has happened, obviously, it's had a big effect on much of our research, but luckily we're able to continue it with cooperation from Jersey Zoo. So we have a volunteer there at the moment who's overseeing the use of these readers for us. Okay, so finally, what other current research am I involved in that you might find interesting? I'm just going to mention these quickly um, because they're not projects that I've set up myself. They're just things that I work on with other people in general at the moment. So I have another PhD student called Sue Wiper, and she spent a year and a half in Rwanda. So if you've heard of Diane Fossey, who did the seminal work on the gorillas, this is the area that Diane Fossey set up, the research centre in Rwanda. It's called Karasoki, and that's where the biggest research centre is for gorillas at the moment. But along with the gorillas, there are these golden monkeys, and people tend to ignore the golden monkeys because all the researchers are interested in the gorillas. So Sue spent a year and a half following a few groups of golden monkeys around the rainforest to learn more about their social behaviour. So she could tell the males apart, by their faces. Sue's very good at recognising monkey faces, much better than I am. And so she could find out who, who they had social relationships with, who they were carrying out aggressive interactions with, and who they were communicating with as well. So she's just finishing her PhD at the moment, but will be publishing some work on looking at their social behaviour, their social networks, and just about their basic social structure, because not much is known about this species at all. So that's really interesting. I'm also working with a colleague um, called Dr. Akaz von Hardenberg and his um, colleague in Italy, Alice Brambia, and we'll be working on alpine ibex. So Akaz does a lot of work with al alpine ibex in Gran Paradiso National Park in Italy. So these alpine ibex live in this national park and there's quite a large population of them. So we've been looking again at social networks in, this, in these ibex, finding out whether the relationships persist over time and also whether they're affected by the seasons. So these ibex have very different habitats in the summer and in the winter. They're in very deep snow in the winter. So we're trying to find out how that's affecting their social relationships. I also have a very different type of collaboration with Professor Carl Smith, who's at Nottingham Trent University. And he works on these fish, which are bitterlings. And bitterlings are very interesting because they lay their eggs in mussels. So they will go up to a mussel and they will lay the eggs in. The male will then come and inseminate the eggs and then the eggs will develop within the mussel. So we're looking at whether we can use social network analysis to understand which males are more successful in um, fertilising the eggs. 
and whether males that guard different muscles have different kind of aggressive interactions with each other. So again, these fish can be implanted with microchips, which can be used um, to locate them. But at the moment, they're doing this work in great big sort of swing pools where the divers can actually go in and monitor the behaviour themselves. As I mentioned earlier, I also do some work with some colleagues in Ghana. <coughs> There's an NGO called the West African Conservation Primate Action, and they work on all the endangered primates in Ghana and in Côte d'Ivoire as well. And one of these endangered primates is called the white naped mangabe. And this is a camera chat photo that one of my students managed to get. So the two master students I showed you a picture of early, earlier on in the presentation, they managed to find evidence that this species was in a rainforest where it had never been found before. So they found a new population of this species in Ghana. So that was really important um, so that they could be conserved, so that this habitat could be better protected for the future. But I'm now using social network analysis to help this NGO with their captive population. So they seize a lot of manga bees and other primates from people who keep them as pets in bad conditions. They also have a captive breeding population in Accra Zoo, which is the, in the capital city of Ghana. So I'm helping them to use social networks to see how to best reintroduce these individuals to the wild. So at the moment, we're just looking at individuals that have lived in the zoo in small enclosures. And then we've been looking at the same individuals in a much larger natural enclosure that's more like a rainforest. So we're trying to see how this is affecting their social structure. And it's all about trying to understand which individuals to use for reintroductions. So if we're going to put animals back in the wild, we want them to be able to survive. So it's very important to understand what their social relationships are needed in the wild for their survival. And then finally, with Dr. Akas von Hardenberg again and a master's student called Matteo Panaccio, I've been working on social networks in alpine marmots. So these guys live in the same area as the alpine ibex in Italy. So we've been looking at the social relationships in these marmots and finding out whether this affects their reproductive success, so how many offspring they produce. Because in a lot of animals, the better social relationships they have, the more offspring they produce and the more likely their offspring are to survive. So that's something we've been looking at in this species as well. OK, I think that's enough talking for now. Um, I hope you're all still there. It's really hard because I can't see you on this software, but hopefully some of you are still there. Um, it was really nice to talk to you today. And I'm just giving a list of my collaborators for some of these projects. So thank you to all of them for their help with all this research. And thank you all for listening. I've put my Twitter handle here in case any of you use Twitter. I'll tweet about this talk afterwards. Um, I've also put a pony because I like the ponies. They're very photogenic. So I'm going to move back to Crowdcast now and ask if anyone has any questions. Thank you for that, Chrissy. Uh, yes, we definitely have at least one question already. Um, if anybody else has a question, there is an ask a question button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, Stuart Murray says, the largest congregations of wildlife I see at this time of year are the skein of geese heading towards the estuary. Would these constitute social networks? How are they organised? Are there leaders and followers? Uh, which ones know how, when and where to travel? Mm. <laughs> yeah, how can you tell things like that? That's a really, really interesting question. So it's something that I don't work on. I'm not an expert in geese, but I do know that a lot of people do work on them. I know somebody who works on grey lag geese, for example. Um, so what's interesting about them is that they do have very different personalities, I know from his research. And so you'll have some individuals that are a lot more bold and others that are a lot more shy. And so their personality can predict whether they're more likely to lead the flock of geese um, than to stay at the back, for example, and how likely they are to find new food sources. So I know people do look at their social networks and they definitely do have them. I think most species, if you look for social networks, they're there. It's just whether we have the ability to detect them. Um, so that's probably all I can say about that. But they are definitely an interesting species to be looking at. Definitely. Uh, one of the things that interested me was the levels of technology that you're using. And it has that accelerated massively recently? 
It really has. I mean, in the last 10 years or so, because we have such more powerful, we have much more powerful computers for a start, so we can deal with much bigger data sets. And so people are collecting great big data sets on these animals. If you can imagine, say you have, I don't know, a thousand fish in a population that all have um, a GPS tag, you can imagine the level of data that you're going to get if you're following them for even a month. So I think the biggest problem at the moment is dealing with the data. So we have a lot of bioinformaticians who are trying to deal with these great big data sets and to find meaning in them because sometimes you can lose the wood for the trees basically there's just so mm. much there yeah. it's difficult to think what's important so yeah technology has been very useful but it can be a bit of a curse as well sometimes maybe and obviously the technology can fail a lot of the time as well which mm. i've definitely had experience of yeah <laughs> haven't we all recently <laughs> Okay, we have a question from Alison that says, are the bats not more active at night? Doesn't that mean they have more interactions then? Yeah, that's a really interesting one. So fruit bats are often more active during the day. So they're usually crepuscular, but they, which means they're active at dawn and dusk. But they actually do a lot of their foraging during the day. So fruit bats don't echolocate. They don't feed on insects. Um, so bats that feed on insects will feed at night because um, they use echolocation, whereas fruit bats will eat fruit, and so they rely on much more visual um, perception. So fruit bats are actually a lot more active during the day. They don't do a lot at night. They're quite lazy at night. So especially, this is all in captivity. In the wild, it may be slightly different. They may do a bit more at night, but they tend to roost at night and be active during the day. And what's interesting at Jersey Zoo is that they use a natural light cycle. So if you've been to Chester Zoo, you'll see that they have the opposite. Yep. So they have the animals in the dark during the day and light at night. And I think part of this is for the visitor experience because visitors imagine bats in dark caves. And so it's more exciting to see bats in a dark cave. And actually for the Seabers bat fruit bats, they are quite active at dark. Um, but the Rodriguez fruit bats would also be active during the day. So actually I used to do some work um, at Chester Zoo with the fruit bats, which is where I became interested in them. Mm -hmm. And if you get there really early in the morning before the visitors are there, then they have the lights turned on and you can see that they're actually quite active when the lights are on as well. So yeah, it's an interesting question. Thank you. Okay. So Andrew and Yvonne Cross, um, we saw the great Orm goats down in the town during lockdown. Oh yeah. <laughs> Do you look at animal interaction with humans in the networks as well? You definitely can. I mean, I saw that. I think that was on international news, the goats invading Clandidno and taking over the world. That's really interesting. It was quite interesting during lockdown, actually, how quickly animals became habituated to being around human areas when the humans weren't there. Yeah. So I think it's quite interesting. If we all die out as a species, then there won't be any effects on the animals. They'll be perfectly happy. Um, but no, we. I don't generally look at the animal interactions. So the work I do, we try and keep the researchers on the outside. We try to make sure they don't yeah. have any interactions. But yeah. obviously, a lot of people do. It depends what question you're asking. But it's definitely possible to use social network analysis to look at interactions with people. So I know a lot of zoo research does that. Yeah. So to look at whether social interactions are influenced by visitors being present, for example. Yeah, I know in, in psychology um, that it is almost impossible to do psychological research without the without the person doing that research actually interacting and that skews the the results you get out of it doesn't it and i'm i, I guess more technology you'd be able to step further back and get more naturalistic things exactly yeah. and it means you can test it as well so now we have the capacity we've always thought in the past that the observer wasn't affecting the animal's behavior but now mm. we have things like what well, cctv even mm. but even having tags and things we can see if the observer being there actually has an effect and it does a lot of the time yeah so i think a lot of the work we've done in the past we've always assumed that we don't have an effect whereas actually we do animals aren't stupid they know if there's somebody there mm -hmm. and they are going to behave a bit differently oh yeah luckily with the fruit bats they're very used to people being around there are always keepers around or members of the public yeah back in the day when i oh i think sue's frozen <laughs> I think she's going to say something very interesting. Sorry. Oh, you're back now. Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Back in the days when I was uh, doing observations of monkeys, I was holding a very brightly patterned folder and the monkeys were going, oh, look at that. Look at what 
oh, oh, but she's got over there. And I'm, oh, dear. Yeah, okay. Well, it's yeah. very interesting with the wild ponies. I used to think that they were very used to me and they ignored me. But suddenly I'd find that when I was in the group of ponies or nearby, the male, the stallion, would kind of come up to me and kind of look at me. And then he'd go and wander off and go and check out what his rivals were getting up to. And I think he saw me as protecting his mares. That's my interpretation. Ooh. He seemed to think because I was there, he was safe to leave them and go and do something else. Mm. And as well, they tended to come and lie down and have a bit of a rest near me as well. So I think they saw me as their helper in some way. So actually, I think I probably did have an effect. Okay. And one interesting thing you said the last time I saw you do this talk was about uh, assumptions that males were leading groups. Yes, because, yeah. yeah, go on, talk about that one. I think in the past, a lot of the researchers have been males. And so a lot of the animal behavioural research has been very male focused on the males leading the groups, particularly in horses. So people always assumed that the stallion was the one who's in charge because you see them rounding up the mares and they're the ones that are very active and showing off. But actually, if you look at who's making the decisions about where they are, it's usually the females making the decisions. Mm. So, for example, in horses, the females are more likely to be lactating or pregnant. Mm. So mm -hmm. they need the food. So actually, it's the females that really decide what the group is doing. And most of the time, if you look at it closely, the females are actually trying to get away from the males. The males are kind of trying to keep them together. But the females usually have the last laugh because they tend to decide where they want to be. Um, they also have what we call extra pair copulations in a lot of species. So in the past, we've always assumed that, for example, in birds, that they're very monogamous. But with the advent of genetic testing, we've now found that I think it's 75 percent of bird species that we thought were monogamous actually aren't at all and they're having all these extra pair copulations mm -hmm. with other individuals so i think actually the male isn't usually in charge the female usually has a very good idea of what's going on <laughs> okay well on that note i think <laughs> we've come to an end thank you very very much for giving up your time um this talk i will be editing